the EU Kids Online project. I'm going to say uh, five minutes just to kind of set up what the panel, what the discussion is about. Uh, I'm then going to uh, introduce the panel and speakers and how we'll work, and then we're going to hear a range of uh, different experiences. But essentially, uh, the bottom line of this um, panel is in the enormous task of trying to research and understand children's um, digital rights or children's rights in the digital age on a global basis, what kind of conversation and collaboration can we imagine between the researchers and the research users? And research users are a very broad category. Researchers are also quite broad with many struggles within them. Um, in the world in which we want evidence-based policy, what kind of conversation, what kind of resources, what kind of collaboration, uh, what kind of standards do we uh, imagine that we uh, wish to see? Um, so I, ha I think of this as a conversation, and there are many different voices that I, I would like to draw in. Clearly, policymakers rely on high-quality research. Nobody, I think, would argue against evidence-based policy for decisions about governance uh, in the field of children's rights. The researchers charged with the task of producing this evidence base, um, I think, are increasingly being heard uh, in governance debates, but probably they are increasingly heard from the global north. Uh, from certain parts of the world, and this is a truly global conversation and challenge. And as we know, um, research is always, as it were, from uh, the recent past, and challenges of internet governance and children's rights are always of the immediate and longer term future. So there are some challenges around scope, and there are some challenges around timing. So what I hope we can ask is what are the priorities for researchers for producing this evidence base uh, for, and I think all these words are the key words, children, rights, global, digital, they're all complex terms, they all intersect with each other in complex ways. We may not agree exactly how we would understand each of those terms. The internet, in a sense, is global, but it's also quite um, different in different contexts. Children's rights, in a sense, are universal, but they are understood in different ways uh, in different contexts. Um, policy making um, is often much more local and national, though, of course, this forum is trying to find ways to make it a global discussion. So what kind of research do um, research users want, policy want researchers to generate? What kind of standards of research would researchers like policymakers to expect? Uh, how can we strengthen and, dialogue and, and promote the dialogue between researchers and uh, stakeholders uh, in, these, in these regards? So I've tried to bring together people from a range of different parts of the world and a range of different um, uh, perspectives. I suppose, uh, informally, the idea began uh, when uh, I was co in coordinating the EU Kids Online project, which is really um, designed as a European project, and trying to understand how researchers could generate the evidence needed for European level and national level policy making. And in the years that we've been working, we've been receiving requests from many other countries outside Europe saying, can we be part of this? Can we learn from you? Can you come and talk to us about what you do? Can we foster a wider um, collaboration? Um, and Europe, of course, is a... Is a um, it depends how you define Europe, everything for researchers is um, open for definition. So in the EU Kids Online project, we include Turkey, and um, one of our speakers is going to talk about uh, how the work can, how the methods and the ideas have worked in Turkey, and what new challenges that poses. Um, in our project, we also include Brazil, which I cannot by any stretch of a definition um, define as Europe, uh, but Fabio Sen from uh, Brazil is going to talk about the rather different challenges of taking a European project, applying, extending, and changing it in a, um, in a Latin American context. 
So there are already ways in which we feel our research being stretched and challenged, but um, there are many further directions that this could go. A second source of inspiration for this workshop was the um, collaboration uh, between EU Kids Online and UNICEF, and Yasmina Byrne is going to talk about that as we try to think about uh, framing a global research agenda and identifying who should be part of that framing and how can one come up with a, fra a research framework or a research agenda when the challenges are so different in different countries and different parts of the world. We know it has to be dialogic, we know it has to be two-way, we know that there can be no uh, dictating from the north what should happen in the south, but where do we go from that recognition? Um, if I think about the perspective of research users, I think they may have different questions in mind from uh, those of the researchers. They may be wondering why researchers take so long to produce any evidence, uh, why they um, don't always answer the questions that policymakers exactly want to be answered. Um, of course, research users are also very diverse, and here we have research users speaking um, from the uh, UN organizations with, and also working in collaboration with NGOs, uh, Yasmina Byrne. We also have uh, Naveen uh, Tufik, who talks from a government perspective about the questions that a government has, uh, and the Egyptian government um, may have some particular questions about how to implement and promote children's rights in a digital age. What are the evidence-based needs there? And then Anki Das, who comes from Facebook, uh, Facebook India, uh, will have a different perspective on how we can think uh, about the, the evidence needs that industry might want and what kind of collaboration researchers can open up or are opening up with industry. These might be very different kinds of uh, conversations. We're going to discover that uh, in the course of this panel. So... Um, that was to give you a sense of what kind of a conversation I'm hoping we're going to have in the next hour and a half. Um, I'm going to ask the uh, three colleagues on my right, uh, Patrick Burton, Kersat Kagiltai and uh, Fabio Sen, to give us a sense of the uh, research challenges as they see them as researchers in trying to uh, produce the evidence base for children's rights in the global digital age. I'm sorry, I should say that um, our colleague Bu Wei from China was um, unable to uh, get the funding to come, so this is um, unfortunate, but we have uh, three excellent colleagues and indeed three continents uh, uh, represented in our, um, in our research panel. Then we have the three sectors of research users who will speak next, um, I think a little more informally. Uh, and then I want to open it up to you. And I know that there are some young people um, in the, uh, who are participating here. I can see some there and uh, perhaps there are others. Yes, good, fantastic. So we would love to have the views of young people. And um, Gitta Stald from the ITU University, raise your hand, Gitta, is going to uh, feed in any insights from the rest of the world uh, as our remote moderator, uh, should those appear. Okay, so um, let us start, if that um, sounds good to everybody, with um, getting a sense from our three um, researchers. And uh, I've asked everyone to do this with no PowerPoint, just to talk. Uh, but um, of course, they may want to say something about particular research projects that they have been engaged in. Um, address that question of, of researching rights. Rights are not very amenable to uh, questionnaires and surveys, so there are some challenges in how we define uh, that research agenda. Um, I've asked them to think a little also about the question of cross-national comparability. Uh, do we expect research uh, conducted, let us say, in Brazil, Turkey, and South Africa to be directly comparable so that we can read across 
our country compared to another country? Or do we expect the research in each country to be true to the contextual uh, distinctiveness and characteristics of those countries? Uh, this is also a challenge. And then I hope that they can say something short about how, um, how they, as researchers, seek to build relationships with research users and what kind of challenges and opportunities they've found there. So I think I'm going to ask um, Patrick uh, Burton from the uh, Centre for Justice and Crime Prevention in South Africa to kick us off for a few minutes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sonia. And I must just say up front that um, as soon as somebody says without PowerPoint, I feel like I've had my hands and my legs chopped off. So um, if this turns into a bit of a ramble, I apologize up front. Um, so, when Sonia asked me to talk on the panel, my mind went immediately to a piece of research that we conducted with UNICEF um, over the lot that we've been, well, we, we, we launched in January this year. Um, and it stemmed from a workshop that I attended about 18 months ago to two years ago, where we had various government departments represented, um, our Department of Communications, Education, um, UNICEF was there, some of the private sector companies, lots of NGOs. And the workshop was all around how do we keep children safe online? And the focus was almost entirely on filtering, blocking, and the sort of services that we pr provide to victims um, of, of online violence, um, abuse. And at the end of it all, there was a, a young girl, probably about 16, 17 years old, who stood up and said, well, we know all of this. You have to spend two hours going through what we should do, what we shouldn't do, what the dangers are, how to block us, how we keep ourselves online, what the filtering. We, we know all of this, and all of our, all of my friends know this. But we're going to get around this. We're going to do what we want to do online anyway, because we're teenagers. Now, a lot of people might disagree with that, um, but I think for many in the room, it, it was a bit like a sort of cold shout, because. Up to that point, we've been approaching, at least in South Africa to a large degree, we've been approaching um, child online safety from a sort of victim perspective. And we'd ignored the sense of agency that young people actually have. Um, and I think that, co that comment drives home very clearly that this was a huge gap that we'd been missing out on. And I think one reason for that is because even though South Africa is really good as a country, um, at a policy-making level, our NGOs are really good at, at child participation, at involving children, research. It's something that hadn't really been done when it came to the work that was being done around child online participation, child online safety in South Africa. And it raised questions around what we were starting to formulate our policies on. And I think what was a, a bit strange, uh, certainly come for, for me, because I come from a diverse background, and we have a very, very good, um, we have great capacity for, doing, for building evidence-based policy around sexual and reproductive health, for example, around violence prevention more generally. And we require very rigorous research. Um, and we, have, we hold very high standards for that research in those fields. But yet, this, these, are not, these standards have not been translated across into the conversations that were being had around child online safety. And so, um, Together with UNICEF, we started thinking about a project that we could start to really engage children more broadly, to figure out how they were using the research, how children in very rural villages that have got very little access to, to electricity, who've got no fixed line telephony, who are reliant purely on mobile telephony, and most of them actually access the internet through the phone, through their mobile phone. How were they experiencing the internet? What were their experiences? How did they react to their experiences online? Um, but at the same time, we wanted to collect some re reliable quantitative data as well. We wanted to be able to match, to get a very nuanced and be able to explore the complexities of young people's experiences. But we also wanted to try and get some, 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 datas, that, some data that we could use to develop indicators around child online safety. What was the extent of violence being um, experienced? What was the access to pornography or the exposure to child pornography? What, was the, what were the levels of child victimization, um, cyberbullying? for example. So we wanted to define very clear indicators around that. Um, and one of the 
the first challenges that we faced was how to involve children in the qualitative side of the research because we we because we engage quite closely with government they wanted to be part of this this conversation and so um, the Department of Basic Education suggested that we work through schools, which is great and was an opportunity that we, we used. But at the same time, then they wanted teachers to be involved in the conversations with kids. And for us, from a research pers perspective, that became a bit of a challenge. Because we could only ask the sort of questions that we were asking on the guarantee of anonymity, that there wouldn't be any identifiers. Because if children are speaking about their experiences in the classroom or of teachers sending them um, naked pictures, which we've had a few incidents of over the last year, they wouldn't want to talk about that in, in the presence of the adults and the teachers that might be involved in this. So we wanted to look at how we engage, we, we, sorry, we wanted to try and make sure we, we ensured anonymity for kids. And I think it was a quite a difficult conversation for us to have with a lot of the, the, the government departments that we were working with, because that for them wasn't ideal. Um, so I'm going sort of scenic route here. Um, I think the next point for us was really around um, looking at where we or how we defined the measures and the sort of research questions that we were going to ask. In South Africa, until recently, we've had almost no research around child online um, protection, child online safety. The studies that have been done have been very small, ad hoc, site-based, um, very small samples, not representative samples. Um, and so we look to projects like the EU Kids Online and other projects to, look, to start looking at some of the international measures that had been used. And what we find, found quite interestingly is that a lot of the, the sort of indicators that were coming out um, were very consistent with what we would expect to find in South Africa and they, they, they translate themselves quite nicely. On the other hand, some of the issues particularly around risks um, and, and harms were a lot more complex. And one of the things that we found very interesting coming out of the research was how children responded to their experiences online. And the impact was a lot, at least superficially, in fact, even using tools like um, uh, sort of, uh, uh, copyright scales, re research scales, um, they seemed to have a lot lower imp or less of an impact psychologically on the psychosocial well-being. Um, that the criminal sort of experiences in what, an EU country um, might have. And so we started to look at what the contextual issues were there, and we were able to unpack it to a large degree in the quality of research that we did. And uh, the issues around maybe the normative nature of violence in South Africa, things that we you know, don't have a great reputation for. Um, but so we, we sort of grappled with that and looked at how we could use standardized measures, but then obviously develop our own um, in South Africa as well. I think. I'll finish off just answering the last question that Sonia put out there, and that's around engaging, um, engaging research users. And I think we were certainly very fortunate, and we are in most of the research that we can conduct, in that we do work closely with government departments, and we have good relationships with NGOs. We are the, the CJCP, the organization I represent, is an NGO. We're a re research NGO, and we do a lot of advocacy work. But we work very closely with government as well. Um, and so, we try to assess up front in the initial conversation, the research design, the sort of questions that both the policymakers would use, but also what would, would Childline, for example, offering counseling ser services, what's the sort of information that they would want to come out of this? Um, and so we were able to almost tailor the study to make sure that we, we, we fed information. Um, I'm sure we missed out a lot of information. Um, but through that initial engagement up front, we're in a position to, to, to make sure that we try to anticipate what some of those needs were. Um. Okay, I'm going to... Um, uh, Patrick, thank you. Uh, I think you've already kind of kicked off a, a whole set of issues because in many uh, parts of the world, this is still a new research area. And of course, researchers have high standards of research uh, data collection and analysis and independence and um, publication and so on. But very often, this is a whole new field and it's very hard to, to, to get the research going uh, quickly. And there are particular challenges around researching children uh, which also need to be
to be taken into account. So um, I know that these are things I spend a lot of time explaining to research users uh, while they uh, explain to me many things about the the politics and the practicalities of, of their work. So let's hear from um, a different um, research context, different project, uh, Kershat uh, Kagletai from the um, Middle, Eastern, Middle East Technical University in uh, Ankara. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, in 1993, we initiated the, the Turkish project, in, uh, Turkish internet project. And we brought uh, the internet uh, in April uh, 1993 for the first time. So at that time, there was a motto. And we were saying that one world, one internet. Uh, but actually, we were wrong. Uh, there is no one internet. Actually, there are different types of internets, different, uh, depending on the, the countries and their social structure, uh, etc. So uh, the research issues, uh, I'm going to uh, share uh, my insights uh, from a more broad perspective. I would, I would like to uh, focus on those differences uh, among uh, countries, and especially and particularly uh, in countries, Turkey, and also similar uh, to Turkey countries, uh, I will focus on uh, challenging issues uh, from those uh, perspectives. Uh, as you may know, according to Freedom House uh, reports, uh, Turkey is seen as a partly free country uh, in terms of uh, press freedom, uh, not a free, uh, in terms of uh, internet freedom, uh, Turkey is a partly uh, free country. So we are also affected by those uh, freedom restrictions. I mean, research is also affected uh, from such uh, differences. So uh, in countries similar to Turkey, uh, there are the challenges and issues of researching uh, children's rights in a global digital age relatively different than the other uh, more uh, highly uh, democratic uh, countries. For example, I experienced this while we are doing research on uh, eKids Online. I mean, the questions, fine. Uh, the, uh, the survey questions were fine, but there was something missing in those uh, questions. Uh, they were very well, maybe they may work very well for uh, Western or democratic countries, but in countries uh, similar to Turkey, uh, which have uh, some problems, uh, we have some different challenges, which I'm going to focus on uh, or uh, share some of those uh, things. For example, uh, research findings are not much appreciated. Uh, mainly political concerns uh, led the decisions. Uh, what the researchers do or what kind of uh, findings they uh, obtain, uh, not much appreciated because there's a political agenda behind uh, the decisions. So, for example, uh, Sonia said, Evidence-based decisions is important. Yes, it's important, but uh, in some cases, uh, political decisions uh, uh, takes more uh, priority. And in general, not much, uh, not, uh, much effort is put on children's rights in the digital age. Uh, rather than focusing on uh, opportunities, uh, generally, uh, state puts most effort on restrictive measures, and this also causes uh, some panicking actions in the society. And evidence, as I said before, do not guide uh, governance decisions. Uh, policymakers just use cherry picking strategy. Uh, they find some uh, some issues uh, from the reports, and they pick them and they use them. I mean, the whole report says something different, but they use uh, some, uh, some parts that uh, to justify their uh, decisions. And another thing is uh, state decides uh, which content is appropriate and which one is not uh, for citizens and also for uh, children. Uh, like in the case of uh, Turkey, I mean, there's a central filtering uh, system, uh, but who makes the decision? There is a 
group of people over there, and these decisions actually are not made based on the research. Uh, research findings do not lead uh, those kind of uh, restrictive uh, measures. Let me give you a particular example. Uh, because of our involvement in EUKIS online project uh, a while ago, Turkish Telecommunications Agency, which is one of the also supporters of this uh, event, which is supposed to be an independent body, uh, asked us to conduct a study on social uh, media use among Turkish kids. So we designed the study, we conduct the research, because as researchers, I mean, we need funding from uh, such agencies. But after a while, we observed that this agency uh, started to promote internet filtering in university campuses, which is not acceptable for an academician. So as a group of academicians, we initiated a, a petition against this uh, filtering action. And so after this peti petition event, uh, this authority, they cut all kind of communication with us because we were considered as bad boys or re rebels. Uh, so they didn't like it. So the policymakers don't like uh, the researchers' uh, actions, ideas, I mean, uh, so then easily they isolate. So designing and conducting a research I mean, from a pure research point of view is not a big deal. but. In those countries, in uh, countries like Turkey, dealing with politics is a, a major uh, issue or a major challenge. So uh, we, in our eKids online project, I mean, we focus on different issues like pornography, uh, cyberbullying, etc., all those uh, kind of problems. But I think, again, uh, there are some other issues too which risks our uh, children. Uh, I want to give you an example, and then I've, I will finish my, uh, my part. Uh, in, in countries, uh, partly free countries, uh, children's rights in a global digital age are actually restricted by the government. For example, according to a recent, recent uh, Pew study, 42% uh, of Turkish young, youngsters are in favor of state-based censorship on the internet. So if our kids raise in, a, in an environment with continuous uh, censorship actions, they tend to see shutting off unwanted voices uh, as something normal. Uh, instead of listening different views, ideas, uh, they tend to perceive them as a threat, uh, as a risk towards the mainstream. Uh, believe. So uh, if you are going to conduct a cross-cultural study, a cross-country study, this, such issues also has to be uh, researched. Uh, yes, pornography, bullying, addiction, are, they are all threats towards children, but destroying free speech and expression of ideas uh, are also important risks, and those uh, issues also has to be uh, researched because uh, those are also important for our uh, children's uh, future. So, as I said, a final word, uh, research issues in different countries uh, are, uh, show some different uh, differences. Uh, so, we have different challenges, different uh, issues. Uh, so, uh, maybe we may also start thinking about uh, those uh, issues and form our uh, research agenda according to those uh, differences. Thank you. OK. Challenges are um, already mounting. And uh, if I, uh, maybe, maybe one key word to keep in mind for the discussion there is the question of independence. Researchers expect their work to be independent. And we value it precisely because it is independent. But if independence means that you can have no say in how the research is interpreted and used, or um, if there are circumstances when the researcher needs to start to become more actively involved in managing the uh, use of that research, uh, there is a whole new set of um, difficulties raised for that relation between researchers and research users. It's not always just the amicable conversation that I implied, perhaps, in my um, opening remarks. 
So um, I don't know so much how the situation is in um, Brazil, but uh, Fabio Sen uh, from uh, CETIC uh, BR is going to uh, tell us. So thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm coming from Brazil, from CETIC, which is the regional center for the development of information society. It's a center of studies. Uh, we produce the statistics and data on the use of ICT, and we are associated with the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, the CGI, which, which is the main body of internet governance in Brazil. Uh, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about some practical things because sometimes uh, is, is the is the the, the really the practical uh, aspects that. Uh, difficult the use and the relation between uh, researchers and research users. Uh, we, we have a, a lot of uh, uh, several uh, surveys on the use of internet in households, schools, uh, health care facilities, by government agencies. We have a lot of information on our website, but I, I'll talk more today about the research we had that name ICT Kids Online Brazil, which is, is it's follow the methodology of You Kids Online Europe. So uh, we started in, in relation with the network uh, leaded by in, in You Kids. And we, we tried to adapt this, this methodology and this framework to the context of Brazil. And I'll, I'll comment some challenges of this process of uh, adaptation. Uh, first of all, uh, first of all, I, I think a digital divide is 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 one aspect that uh, that really uh, makes things d uh, different and more difficult to us and and to uh, comparing to Europe, for, for instance. So. Digital divide has, f uh, for instance, some practical uh, challenges. So, first of all, you need to knock on more doors to find uh, children that are internet users. So, in comparison with uh, Europe, you have to find uh, children between 10 and 16. Now, we, we, you have them um, uh, until 17 years old. And you have to find internet users to see how they how are how they are using the internet in in their daily lives so it's a it's a very practical uh, aspect but it it's 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 the the survey becomes more costly more difficult to to implement uh, and and talking about brazil which is a country very with huge inequalities we have regional uh, inequalities we have uh, differences between the north east in, in the amazon side and the 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 southeast region so it's very difficult to plan a sample size that can represent this this country uh, in a reliable way so this is a practical accident but digital divide also uh, brings other more sophisticated problem for instance we have 51 in, in 2013 we had 51 percent of parents interviewed by our server were not internet users so we have we have parents the children is internet user but the parents is not so how mediation uh, how the process of mediations and the, the, the questions about mediation can be evaluated if half of the of the parents simply don't use internet they, are, they don't know what what they are talking about so Digital divide, I think it's one difference that we, we need to consider. Um, but we have in Brazil a very intense use of, of, of internet by children, uh, and it's growing up very, uh, very fast. So we had in, in 2012, we have kind of 30% of, of children using uh, internet uh, with uh, by mobile phone and now in in, in 2013 we has like 43 or, or something like that I can show you I can send you the numbers but it's growing very very fast and 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 
you, you need to consider that to plan. And, and these are some challenging, important challenges in this kind of survey. Uh, and I think um, I think it's also, it was also too important to consider the, the relation with uh, research users. So uh, in Brazil, we we try to uh, we invest a lot of time. And, and so the, the planning of this the survey uh, lasted kind of one year and a half to plan and to adapt the, the questionnaire, to translate the questionnaire. We did cognitive interviewings with, with children to understand how they, they really comprehend, how they deal with the questions that they are using. We have children here, do you know, in, uh, in one year, the devices like changes uh, the, the the ways children use internet changes in the very fast changing way. So uh, we you had to adapt this, and I think it's is an important issue to to remark here. Uh, research uh, governments and and international bodies need to know that we need to invest time and money on on this adaptation because it's not easy it's not simple uh, to try. it is i think it's easiest to uh, invent an, another survey that you do maintain comparability so i think it's very important to to invest in, in this and uh, so don't just uh, Finishing my my first comment, uh, so I think uh, reliability is a, is a, is an issue very important. So you have to invest money and time in adapting uh, methodologies, but we have a, a, a very a huge pressure on updated data. So. Uh, in in internet, if you have data from the past year, you are kind of ah, why, why don't you have uh, data from this year, from now? So it's it's, it's a pressure on the users for updated uh, information. So uh, we are trying to do this this ICT Kids Online in Brazil annually. So we had I had here in 2012. It was the first edition of the survey. It's available online. Uh, in English also, and, and you can download on our website. And I have here data from 2013. So we we we, we always launch data on the uh, about the last years. So it's a time we we, we can uh, manage to to pr promote uh, th this uh, survey and to pro to provide data to government, international agencies, and, and other things. So. I think reliability, updated data, and uh, some comments on digital divide, which is a very a challenge, important challenge on, on how to to you kids online became a global kids online, or how to uh, promote global data on the use of uh, internet by kids. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Fabian. So um, you're getting a sense, I think, of the things that researchers worry about, which are probably uh, different from um, research users. Uh, and um, I'm sitting looking at uh, Larry Majid and Anne Collier, who, uh, with whom online we have many conversations about how to evaluate the quality of research and what do we do with the fact that research studies will say that anything between 2 and 92% of uh, children are being bullied on the internet at any one time. And then we all start to scrutinize the samples and the methods and, and you know, how the data was collected. And the questions that my colleagues are mentioning becomes very important. But then I go to conferences and people say, so your data was from 2010. So, you know, where's the update? Janice Richardson likes to say this to me when uh, uh, wanting yet another survey. And then we come to questions of funding, which matter, even though, of course, no one ever has enough money. But 
funding is part of the story about independence, which was so important to Cassatt's story, because of course there is money, but um, often one has to look at exactly what kind of influence might have come with the sources of money. So I think there are some, these are some really um, difficult and probably um, insoluble uh, conversations. But I'm going to ask our three um, research users to be very brief in commenting, um, because I do want to hear um, from others. So sort of three to five minutes each, really, on, on those, how they respond to some of those challenges and what, what really evidence needs they have, speaking um, from the different uh, sectors, that, uh, s sectors that they do. And any, any practical ideas about how to build better relations so that research findings are better used um, to, to inform debates as they unfold, but also perhaps um, we can, uh, this can be a learning on both sides. So um, I'll start with um, uh, Yasmina Bern from um, uh, the research office of uh, UNICEF in Florence, who has um, several times said, so Europe is so small, what about the rest of the world? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Sonia. Um, yes, I, I work in the UNICEF Office of um, uh, Research, and uh, in a way, UNICEF is uh, uh, involved in research, but is also a research user. We work in 150 countries, and uh, in this uh, day and age, uh, information, knowledge, and data actually have a very important impact on how UNICEF delivers for children. So research is critical for us, but also global knowledge. Uh, it helps us connect and learn from one another and improve our delivery of services. And it helps us identify opportunities for experimentation, for collaboration, innovation. Uh, but in the global context also, uh, we are looking more and more at policies. We are talking about national policies and evidence base that influences policies. Uh, policies are also becoming global and uh, UN bodies are setting standards and guidelines. On Friday, uh, UNICEF and ITU are launching guidelines on online protection for um, the industry. So in order to be able to develop in, uh, such policies, we need to have data that is comparable, at least data that can tell us more than what is going on in one country, but what is going in a number of countries uh, so that we can have an accurate uh, and better understanding. Um, and, and also, um, we need to know how and for what purposes children use internet in different parts of the world. Uh, how their rights exercised in the digital age as an organization that is very concerned with children's rights. We are looking at, at all rights of children and interconnectedness of these rights because all of these rights are indivisible. So if we are talking about uh, protection of children and freedom of expression, we need to think about um, how do we actually make sure that when children have freedom to express their opinions online, they're not penalized for that, or they don't get uh, harmed because of that? Or, on another hand, uh, if uh, the children who express their opinions about others online do not harm other children through bullying, for example. Uh, but we also recognize that our own research uh, faces some challenges. That is, research that has been done in country offices with different in academic institutions and, and with independent researchers. Um, and we, we, we have poor baseline, which makes it very difficult for us to evaluate the impact of programs and interventions that we uh, try to help governments and N NGOs develop. Uh, often research um, addresses only one aspect, um, either it's a protection or it's cyberbullying without looking at broader, um, the broader elements and, and the causes of this. Uh, research, uh, very rarely we have follow-up or longitudinal data as we hear now from Brazil, which is fantastic that they do this online um, research, uh, e Brazil Kids Online every year. And, and uh, approaches to research in different countries vary. We use different methodologies, uh, and, and it's really making it difficult for us even to understand and to have a, a global comparative data. So what we need is really cross-country comparative data or even regional data that will help us understand trends, but also dri what drives these trends in children's usage. Where are the similarities and differences, and what can be learned from similar approaches or, or different approaches uh, to, to, uh, to, to similar issues? Uh, so I, I just want to point out that 
when we talk about global research, we don't have to start global. There are countries that don't necessarily uh, are, that are not necessarily in the same region, but they have more similarities in terms of their income status or their the, uh, level of infrastructure and ICT access. Equity is a very important issue. We heard also that that was a challenge in Brazil. Uh, so knowing at least uh, where these groups of countries have similarities uh, can help us. We also need to be mindful of the context, uh, how in, in, in different places uh, we also need to interpret these universal principles be ma and make sure that we take into account the context. We heard about absence of parental involvement in some places. In other countries, we even find that children don't live with parents and that uh, this is even uh, another challenge because they don't have that responsible adult or a parent-like figure. And, and the last word is really the quality challenge. I think it has been mentioned a couple of times. Uh, good quality research and evaluations take time, whereas policymakers and even the private sector do want results very fast. So how do we, it's more of a question, how do we make sure that we stay true to the research principles and to have good quality research at the same time to meet the needs of policymakers? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Mina. Great. Um, so, um, Naveen, uh, governments haven't had a very good uh, press so far on this panel, uh, and you speak for the, uh, you, you explain how you are part of the Egyptian okay. government, but uh, Naveen Tufik from uh, uh, okay, Egypt. thank you so much, Sonia, for inviting me to this uh, workshop. Actually, it's a very long overdue workshop. I've been asking for that uh, since Lithuania, a villainous in Lithuania. So I'm really glad that we're discussing this uh, particular issue of uh, the research uh, uh, problems that uh, are facing us in the area, particularly of child online uh, protection. Actually, I have different hats. I am a government employee, but I'm also the rapporteur, the coordinator of the national multi-stakeholder a group on child online safety, which gives me some uh, flexibility to maneuver a little bit the government. And originally, I'm a political science teacher. I'm a researcher by training. So I'm very much, of course, biased to the research side. Uh, and I do agree that sometimes research is not very comfortable for government because it makes always all decisions much more difficult. However, on this particular issue, I think that uh, research uh, uh, evidence-based uh, policies is extremely important. When we started our program Child Online Safety back in 2009, we did not have much research. We, we really ba based our work on um, extrapolation from different studies that were conducted uh, mostly in the global north and some uh, small studies that were conducted in Egypt and similar countries. And gradually we realized that we cannot go on like that and that there is a clear need for uh, studies that are research that is contextualized in Egypt itself or in the Arab countries. What we try to do um, is actually to map up to see what, what exists, what kind of research exists in the different or uh, major institutes in Egypt and also on the level of the Arab countries. And uh, I've done this with my colleagues who are working on the internet program and we realized that most research that exists, particularly in the five last years or a little bit six last years, is mostly about internet addiction, uh, empowerment, education, um, uh, but there is almost no research about child online protection. Nothing based or nothing focusing on child online protection. I do have the list of research. We've, you've actually been interested in looking into that. Uh, the other thing that we found is that there, are, uh, there is some research on the legal aspects, and most importantly, the research that ICMIC has been conducting, and Egypt has been a country that was covered by the report of ICMIC, uh, particularly on the legal sides. Uh, what we try to do in the government is to bridge this research gap. I don't know if we um, use the right approach, but uh, we decided that we need as much as possible to start collecting more evidence. And uh, luckily, we worked with the GSMA and NTT Docomo for three years uh, to have uh, a research on children use of mobile phones. This was an international comparison that was uh, conducted in 2013. Um, and we convinced them, and they were very responsive to us, to have a comparative study between Algeria, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia. It took us two years, but 
we, we've done it, and at least we have some numbers now about the use of uh, mobiles. Another research was also GSMA in 2012, um, and in this case it was actually Egypt, Chile, India, Indonesia, and Japan, and in 2011. So how did we do that? We didn't do it on our own, not at all. It was, again, a multi-stakeholder approach. We approached DSMA as a government, and then we approached Mobinil, one of our mobile operators, and they were very happy to do that as part of their corporate social responsibility. So we have a very good chance uh, in the Global South, actually, to draw on the corporate social responsibility of the different companies and to conduct this kind of work, and they are very open to this particular uh, agenda. Uh, Another company, of course, I cannot mention all companies, but Microsoft was very also um, very responsive to our needs, and we've conducted also a small research on privacy. And of course, it was quite shocking because we noticed uh, how much the notion of privacy was almost lost among young people. Uh, these are some examples. However, I, I do believe clearly that if we do not have regular research, a plan for research, then uh, we don't have uh, much food for thought. We need to see what is happening, the kind of progress that is happening, or uh, to, to measure actually uh, how our policies are uh, doing in terms of the issues that we are uh, discussing. Um, so I'll, I'll just move to my last point. What, what is my recommendation? What I'm looking forward? I'm not looking forward for the Global South to have funding to conduct the research. What we're looking forward is, have, is to have a knowledge transfer. What we need is actually to have a kind of conference like the one that was conducted by UNICEF and Berkman, not taking place in the UK, but maybe ne the next part taking place in Egypt, India, or the Global South. The other thing is to have actually researchers from the north uh, building the capacity of our own researchers. Then our team would take off and uh, continue this journey. So these are very briefly my comments. Thank you. OK, um, so be ready with your questions and comments. We have one more intervention. Did I just give you warning that I'm about to turn to you? But first, uh, and by no means least, uh, Anki Das from um, Facebook India. Uh, give us your perspective, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Uh, I also wanted to give, though uh, sort of I'm here as a Facebook representative, but I also wanted to give a perspective from the South, because yeah. in addition to India, I also look at South Asia and uh, Central uh -huh. Asia, which is all sort of representative of the South. Uh, I think just to carry further the point which uh, you know you were making, uh, there, if we have to look at scalability of global models, I think it is very important to look at local capacity building of academic networks and research institutions in the South uh, to make it more accessible in terms of what needs to be done. As a research user, as Facebook, what we've been doing for the last four years is that our engineers, researchers have been working with universities like Yale and Berkeley and other networks of researchers to take input in terms of how our reporting tools can be improved. And, uh, and you probably know this, Sonia, but others may not, that uh, the social reporting tool which we came up with uh, which is kind of a resolution tool where uh, people can basically interact with each other and report content and have an adult mediate and sort of take down content which is deemed objectionable or inappropriate amongst teens is something which came up as a consequence of these interactions with uh, research organizations and researchers and universities. Because, you know, these are specialists in academic institutions, in development psychology, in sociology, etc. And therefore, there is this interaction which happens between engineering and all these areas of social sciences. Uh, so there is th this very real need of collaboration between the private sector and the research organizations to make sure that these insights inform the kind of the engineering roadmap also within these uh, companies. And there's evidence to show that we've actually taken input from, uh, from, uh, from research organizations. And Compassion Research Project is kind of a forum where every year in our headquarters in Menlo Park, we bring in the safety community leaders of our safety advisory board, as well as uh, the, uh, you know, sort of the organization which is for safe family and online safety institute, as well as other contributing researchers to come and share best practices. But 
I've been a big adv advocate in my company is, is that how do we take this out from headquarters into the regions, into the field, because that's where the real growth of the internet is happening. That's where the access is really a top issue. And if that is going to be happening in the emerging markets and in the global south, there has to be corresponding capacity building and development in the academic institutions. So one idea which I've been talking about a lot within the private sector, within ICC bases, et cetera, is that how do we think about kind of replicating the internet observatory project, which is there and sort of look at projects in the field where you create a network of centers of academic institutions which actually look at this, and then collectively the private sector can work with them while retaining the boundary conditions of independence of academic research. But those outputs then become kind of a bibliography which uh, you know sort of private sector can draw on. And whether it is a, you, whether you are a small application developer which is coming out of Bangalore, or whether you are a large global platform, everybody can access the same level of uh, you know information and research outputs and bake it into the engineering roadmap. So those are the kind of points which I wanted to make. Like there's this very real need. Uh, and there's benefits both ways in terms of that collaboration happening, but we have to decentralize the model. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I just say thank you to everyone on the panel um, before we open it up? Just, uh... Well, I know I made everyone speak very fast and I wanted a flow, but I just want to acknowledge how well everyone kept to time so that we would have um, uh, half an hour for discussion. Um, Lots of points got raised, uh, and there are a number of young people in the room. I don't know if they would like to take this opportunity to pitch in. I'll come to you, but you're not quite young enough. Um, if there are any young people who want to especially pitch in and say something um, to kind of get us going about the research being done with you, on you, about you, Grace, please. Yeah. Grace, do you want to come forward and use one of these? Sorry, and I'll turn mine off. Oh, OK. Thank you very much. So it's a very hot, crowded room, I do know. Um, you were talking about how to make the research that you're doing and you're spending so much time doing more effective. And I've always found myself that somebody telling me a statistic doesn't really have much of an effect. But if I can see it, and if I can physically see that um, a huge number of something is happening, then it kind of makes me realize what's going on. But my point is, a lot of research that's done is presented at these events and is presented to companies. But um, children or young adults or parents never get handed this kind of information in a really um, simplified version and kind of to the point and the main point shown to them. So I was wondering if there was any way that we could create a simplified version of every research um, report that comes out. Maybe not every, but the most important ones anyway. Brilliant. Something like the, um, the child-friendly uh, version of the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child. Yeah, we exactly. Could have, we could have a, a, a simpler version. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great idea. I know there are several people in the room who uh, have this um, ambition, at least, but just other points from uh, the youth participants here, if you would like. Do you guys want to? Yeah, please. Uh, hello, I'm Michael from Hong Kong. Um, I have access to pornography since I'm seven. Yes, and if my, yes, I see you quite surprised, but that is the what I saw in Hong Kong and in my community. Uh, my classmates and friends, they all have access to those um, things, and I saw research in Hong Kong and they published and saying um, that this issue is no, not a big problem and, and everything's going so all right. And I'm afraid um, researchers are not interpreting the result correctly, or, although they might have concrete evidence and the, they have the figures. Um, sometimes I think they have more than a faith instead of truth. That is not a knowledge. And that is maybe, I wonder if it is only happening in Hong Kong. And yes, thank you. Thank you. 
Um, yes, there are many um, accounts of these difficult issues around children's experiences um, online, and uh, we are, everyone speaks with particular voices, perhaps for particular reasons. Um, so that's a helpful intervention. Uh, maybe I can put these two together. The research should not only be made accessible to the young people, but checked against their experience and their accounts as they, as they see it. Yeah, okay, um, so I can open it more widely and everyone might um, pitch in. Um, patient man here, yes. Do you, uh, if you could just say your name and where you're from uh, uh, as we go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I am working for Information and Communications Technologies Authority of Turkey uh, as an ICT expert. Uh, Mr. Kürşat Çağıltay expressed his opinions regarding Turkish experience about child online protection. Uh, I also want to make some additional points about the issue. Mainly, uh, as ICT Authority of Turkey, our main objective while making legislations is to protect children from harmful content in the online environment. I want to highlight this point. Additionally, uh, ICT Authority of Turkey is working with several partners while making these leg legislations, such as ITU, Council of Europe, European Union. And additionally, we are working with uh, NGOs in Turkey, and we are open to all opinions coming from uh, NGOs and other people. As all you know, a Guide to Human Rights for Internet Users has been published by Council of Europe, and as Turkey, we are also taking this document into consideration while making decisions about child online protection. And I think that it's a very important and valuable uh, document regarding the issue. Additionally, I want to highlight that everybody in this room uh, agrees on the fact that child online protection is crucial and all children has right to be protected from harmful content in the online environment. Within these consider considerations in mind, uh, as ICT Authority of Turkey, we have implemented safer internet service regulation. And this is a very good example, uh, which aims to protect children from harmful content in the online environment. Uh, within the service, if anybody, if any internet user wants to use safer internet, he can choose it. But if he doesn't want to use this, this service, internet access service of the user does not change. Hence, uh, I can uh, say that this is one of, the, one of the best examples in the world which aims to protect children and young people uh, in the online environment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Larry, yes. Just say who you are. He, he is, actually, yeah. All right. Once again, <laughs> Larry Magid with ConnectSafely.org. I want to make a comment about research, but I want to respond to that gentleman's comment for a moment. I think most of us would agree that we want to protect children from harmful content. But what we might not agree on is what is harmful. And I know in the United States, our Supreme Court has had a tough time uh, defining that, which is why when Congress passed the Communications Decency Act in 1997, thank you, um, it was shot down by our Supreme Court because what some people considered harmful content, other people considered political speech, and other people considered art. And so it's very, very difficult, and I know that Turkey is really struggling with this issue as to where one draws the line, but I would urge you that the word harmful content is contextual, and it, it can, it's contextual by region, uh, by political persuasion, uh, by age, uh, and also, of course, children between zero and 18 are not one body. I mean, what is harmful to a two-year-old may not be harmful to a 17-year-old. So just a response to that. But what I really raised my hand to talk about is, uh, as, as Sonia knows, I am in addition to Connect Safely, I'm also a journalist. And like Anne, we read and report on what our colleagues say in the press about reporting, about research. And what I've noticed is that what typically happens with research is that the researchers will put out a press release and the journalists will not go beyond the press release and that is all they report. 
Now, in the case of EU Kids Online and Pew and Crimes Against Children Research Center and some of the other really legitimate organizations, the press releases typically actually accurately reflect the research. But it is not uncommon, especially when companies are commissioning research, for the press release or even the executive summary to completely distort the data that's actually collected. So for example, I saw a report a couple of years ago and the headline of the press release was shocking data about children's, uh, children and bullying. But the actual data wasn't at all shocking. In fact, it was actually somewhat reassuring. But it, it was in the interest of this company to uh, exaggerate the data. So I would first of all uh, agree with our young friend here that it's very important that we summarize this research, not only so that children can understand it, but so the rest of us can as well, because with all due respect, Sonia, even though I happen to have a doctor degree in survey research, even I sometimes have trouble understanding the way my co former colleagues in academia write. So we need to translate it into human language as well as academic language, and then probably kids will understand it, because most of them can read well as well as adults can. But beyond this, we need to educate journalists to understand what is sampling, what is methodology, uh, what are double-barreled questions. There's just a million ways that even though figures don't lie, that liars can figure, and that marketing people can misinterpret what legitimate researchers are, are coming up with. <laughs> okay, this is our challenge. Yes, um, yes, 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 Kassa, please, also. And uh, please uh, be uh, ready with your next point. Okay. Uh, nobody says we should not protect our children. Yes, definitely we should protect. But uh, I also told this uh, quotation in, in, a, in the meeting in Harvard University. Uh, those who desire to give up freedom in order to gain security will not have, or uh, do they deserve either one, Benjamin Franklin said. So yes, protection is important. Uh, security is important, but freedom is also important. I uh, agree with the gentleman. I mean, we have such a system in Turkey to protect children. But who makes the decision? I mean, who makes the decision that some content is not appropriate for children, for our children? Is the system uh, multi-stakeholder? Is the system transparent? Uh, for example, let me give you an example. Uh, Marxist ideas, if there is a, a website about Marxism, is this uh, harmful content for our children? Or a guy who has a website about at atheism, uh, who, uh, who is converted from Islam and who decided to be an atheist. So his website, is it inappropriate for our children? I mean, who makes this decision uh, in, uh, for, my, for my kids? So if we are going to establish uh, mechanisms for our kids, this has to be open, this has to be uh, transparent, not under the control of the uh, pure uh, government. Thank you. Thank you. I think... Um, Yes, we're getting a great sense of the difficulties for those of us sitting uh, in universities, perhaps feeling a little safe in there, uh, worrying about uh, where our research goes when it gets out into a world which is truly contested. And just to make one point, I wanted to emphasize rights at the start, because it's fairly easy to research who has a computer or who has a smartphone or how many hours a day, but rights are not something you can see and measure with a ruler and say, now I am measuring rights and now I am not measuring rights. So there is a real task of translation to understand what do we mean by protection? What do we mean by participation? What kind of provision do we want children to have? And we are, as soon as we say rights, we are already moving from the descriptive, which is the true territory, many would say, of researchers into the normative. And the normative is where the struggles are and the ways in which research gets described differently and the way in which the spin is put on the headline. This is all in trying to kind of manage how the measures are translated into a genuine and contestation about, about rights. So I think these are, this is what I wanted us to discuss. And Anne is perhaps going to say something uh, wise and then I have two more here. So yes, Anne Collier from Connect Safety. Thank, Thank you. you. Not, not wise at all, just questions. <laughs> um, Patrick and Naveen both kind of 
tossed out some teasers, and I would love to ask a follow-up question of each, if, if it's okay, and say no. I'll start with Naveen, because um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but say no if, if, if you are, um, don't have the data. But you, you mentioned several very recent studies, and I wonder if there were two or three top takeaways that were especially interesting or surprising that these studies um, turned up that you could share the study about um, maybe Egypt youth on the mobile platform or? I remember that in the comparative study between uh, uh, Paraguay, Egypt, India, and Japan, uh, Egypt had the highest uh, usage of mobile phones among children. <laughs> You, those accessing the internet on mobile phone. It was very surprising. I don't remember the other results, but I remember this uh, particular... Uh, what, what were the ages of the children? No, I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember the details. And Patrick, it, if I heard you correctly, you said something about um, how the impacts on South African youth seem to be less than European youth. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, yeah, essentially what we, we did is we used the, the child trauma symptom checklist um, as one of our, our scales um, in one of the instruments. And we actually saw relatively low levels if you look at each of the well, various items. And I, I'd be lying to you if I can go through them all now. But, but um, there were relatively low uh, sort of depression, lack of sleep, poor sleep, um, irritation, a, a, a lot of those kind of measures that we, we used. Um, a lot less so than, for example, exposure to offline violence, um, schoolyard, school vi violence, etc. which in South, the South African context is quite interesting because particularly cyberbullying is, is portrayed particularly in the media as being the sort of epidemic that is far worse than other forms of violence against children. When I say far worse, it is more pervasive. Um, so, so that's really the, the um, what I meant by that. We also just perhaps to add in, we're collecting data from another 10,000 children at the moment as part of the UBS Optimist study that's looking at exactly the same um, sort of items, which will hopefully add even more insight into that. So cyberbullying seemed to have less impact. Uh, is it just less pervasive? It didn't have less impact on children than in Europe? Uh, both. And I can't, again, I can't give you the, the exact comparative date, data, but the argue, what we saw coming out of the connect.com study was both. It was, I don't know, okay, wait. Let me think carefully about how I'm phrasing this. Um, I'm not sure if the rates were lower than in Europe. Um, I mean, we, if, amongst 12 to 18 year olds, we saw around 22% of, of children experiencing some form. Um, and that's from a sample of about 6,000. Um, uh, sorry? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I thought it was offhand. Um, and, and the impact, so both then. Um, so uh, there were two points here. I'm just going to make another very quick intervention to say I love the way that Naveen can't remember the results. Don't, don't take this the wrong way, except where your country is the highest. Oh, yeah. And this is... <laughs> um, I, but it's so true and it's so common. And as researchers, we're kind of learning that rankings really help people to get the results. But we also hate doing it because it takes away the kind of context that Patrick was just trying to put around around the cyberbullying figures when we make these comparisons. And yeah, <laughs> it's just a hard conversation. Anyway, uh, Jutta Kroll, and then I come to you. Yes, <clears throat> Jutta Kroll from the German Center of Child Protection on the Internet. I would like to come back to the question raised by you about who decides what is appropriate for our children. And when I quote Larry from yesterday, you said that the most important filter is between the ears of the, of the person that has access to the internet, so between the ears of the children. Uh, but this does not come by itself. It needs some education. And we've done at the German Center some research and technology assessment on the usage of children between one and 16 years of mobile devices within the next two to three three to five years to come. 
and it turned out that one of the most important aspects is that parents are able to guide that process. We will face younger and younger children, even toddlers, who are using uh, mobile devices with access to the internet. And it's just true that they will not be able to decide by themselves. Then it's up to the parents to guide them and to help them. So we need some more research. We cannot research the filter between the ears, I think. That's a little bit tricky, but I think we need some research how we can help parents to guide the children in that process. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm whispering to Fabio, I thought he might want to say something about the difficulty of researching and advising parents when so many parents are in fact not on the internet at all, as in, as in Brazil. Yes. No, of course, uh, we have, so in this methodology of, uh, of ICT Kids Online and EU Kids Online, you have to, to interview always one children of the household and one parent responsible. Uh, it's interesting because in Brazil, uh, in the, the children is randomly selected, so you had to pick up one uh, children in the household, so it, it's, it's, all, it's random, randomized. But the parents are selected by a, a kind of screening, the who, who is the parent who, who know more about yeah. the children. And in Brazil, you have 80% of uh, of women responding, uh, answering the, 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 this question. So you have 80% of mothers, especially, uh, responding on, on, on behavior of uh, children. And 51% of our parents are not internet users. So it, it's, there are very uh, difficult uh, things to address when you are designing a, a, yeah. a questionnaire like that. And just very briefly, I, I like to comment. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so I want to comment the, 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 que the question of my colleague from Hong Kong. That uh, because a, a research and survey it is always, I think it's survey is a conversation. It's, it's a kind of conversation you have with, with somebody, and actually with somebody you don't know. So it's very tricky how to, to design a questionnaire to, to make people f free to, to answer things about sexual content and violence and, and stuff like that. So there are some techniques that, that you can improve to make uh, the response. Uh, be be more accurate. So uh, researchers do uh, know that researchers know that people don't answer exactly how they they, they feel. So we have to design. So we have to think about how to design questionnaires and how to design methodology to consider uh, the characteristics of the the, the, yeah. the public. You are yeah. just sorry. just Thank a you. quick answer to that position. I think it's also necessary to talk to those parents who are not on the internet because they also yeah. give education yeah. to their children and if they if you don't understand why they are not on the internet why they don't get the skills and the competence then yeah. it's difficult to 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 design programs for these people and also other adults in charge of minors could be interesting interview partners as well not only the parents are influencing the education yeah yuta thank you um, so i think i young men from Hong Kong would like to answer, and then I have a question here and here, and then, we, and then there, and then we might be coming to the end. So, guys, yes. Uh, hello, this is Enoch. I'm an, uh, a NetWire ambassador from Hong Kong. Uh, so just about uh, that, the fact that uh, people, uh, especially child, they maybe sometimes do not answer to, to the researchers' uh, questionnaires and uh, make the research uh, uh, less accurate. I think that an alternative way to do this is by a, a thing called peer research. So basically it's uh, maybe the research can be conducted by teenagers so uh, it, it can uh, it, it can more uh, better communicate with the, the, the children and ask about what they really think, really do think, because uh, similar to to the internet issue, there's uh, 
there, there was a research about, uh, the, there's a questionnaire about whether school children in Hong Kong uh, take drugs or not. And then uh, the, the <laughs> And then the result was, uh, of course, uh, no one was admitting they, you know, <laughs> to, to take drug, of course. So this is the problem that when adult ask question to child, they are sometimes afraid of their responsibility to think. And, and, and teenagers will tell the truth to their peers? Uh, is that I think, <laughs> I think it's, it's maybe it will be an alternative way to to, to this problem, so this is my suggestion. Um, may I have some um, ex further explanation? Um, we boldly suggest this um, research method because we think um, children and adults is like two different countries. Um, we need someone to translate the language. Um, and, yeah, and the cultural difference, the digital divide is um, um, could be solved um, when youth to um, join this research to, yeah, to, to do the work. Thank you. We have to make a bridge between these countries and you are helping, I think, to do this. Yeah, did you want to add? And yeah, yeah I'm Vincent okay. from um, Namishan.Asia. And catching up with Nino's points, yeah. sorry, I'm, I'm too loud. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, it is this button. Yeah. Okay. Catching up with Enoch's points, I think that in fact, um, you guys talking about the translation problem, about like keeping it simplified in order to deliver to the teenagers. In fact, if we carry it out like peer peer um, peer consulting or peer. Um, researching. In fact, in that way, uh, the, t the child, the, the peer, will ask, like, what are you doing, in fact? Like, how is the research going? And then that's the way of teenagers presenting their research to their teenagers. And that's the way that we can make it easier and simplified it in a teenager's version in order to promote our research. And I think that is an efficient way of doing this. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. That's a great suggestion. Um, patient man here. And then there, and then I'm going to ask the panel for last things. Unless, Gitta, you want to tell me that the, the, world, the world is active? <laughs> They're listening? OK, cool. All right, please. Thank you, Sonia, for this great meeting. Uh, I believe that uh, the filtering services are not a solution for child online protection. Uh, Sorry, you didn't, can you just say who you? Uh, I'm from uh, Turkish Telecommunication Authority. Uh, I believe that uh, the filtering services are not solution for child online protection. Uh, on the other hand, I believe that uh, we have to give this choice to uh, internet users, especially to internet users, the uh, decent choice. And on the other hand, uh, the awareness activities are mostly important. Uh, for example, uh, our authority uh, started with uh, EU Kids Online project and uh, lastly uh, we initiated a project with uh, National Ministry of Education in Turkey. Uh, under this project uh, we educated 400 uh, ICT teachers and uh, they uh, trained uh, almost 52,000 uh, teachers within one year from uh, internet safety to cyberbullying, from internet, internet addiction to digital citizenship. So the education part is very, very important, and we try to uh, explain uh, this subject. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, we uh, teach to our internet users, especially to our uh, children, uh, to be better digital citizenship with uh, their rights and responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. So sometimes it can be a constructive relation between researchers and research users. That's encouraging. Uh, please, yeah. And then I'm going to come back okay. to last things from the panel. Yes. Thank you so much. My name is Jonathan from Red Sovianga Foundation Uganda. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, I have a little comment or suggestion. I think uh, there should be a standard guideline uh, put aside on internet uh, to guide organizations which implement research involving children because uh, where you come from, we have got very many problems in organizations trying to take up research involving children. Uh, some organizations go to schools, go to communities, and they ask some irrelevant 
question is uh, to these young people, uh, there was even an extent when some researchers were chased out of school by police. When they were asking really some bad question is uh, to children saying that they are researching. So I think the experts may help us and develop some standard guidelines and they put them online which can easily be access, which can, uh, in a way that they can easily be accessed and uh, it will help uh, to simplify the work in research. I uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, we are pretty much out of time, so though I know that there are many more things people would love to say, mm. I'm going to ask um, the panel here um, if there are further things, that, last points that they would like to make. I know that Yasmina Van has one, so she can kick off, and others or three might have <laughs> one or two uh, minutes if they win. I, I think uh, definitely there should be ethical standards, uh, and we all know who, who when doing research with mm -hmm. children, and, and there are uh, now organizations who are trying to mobilize the uh, internationally academic community to have international standards, and we have produced some as well, UNICEF. You can find them on our website. But also I want to say um, in relation to, to the parental roles and responsibilities, uh, our small quant qualitative research from Kenya and, U and, and um, Uganda was showing that children learn how to use internet from peers, from uh, youth mentors, from older brothers, from teachers, uh, from people in their community, not necessarily from parents. So we also need to understand how children learn so that we know who to actually approach to help them actually uh, deliver these uh, and, and, and help them mediate internet if there is no parent at home, so that parental figure is important. And, and just like, last point is, uh, coming back to a very old document, 25 years uh, in November, a Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, I just once again want to mention that all the rights of the child are interconnected. It's the most comprehensive human rights instrument that calls for provision, protection, and participation of children. And we can't pick and choose rights. They're all linked and they're indivisible. So when we approach children's rights in this age, day and age, and digital age, we need to keep that in mind. But also, as Sonia was mentioned, to understand how they apply in this different uh, online context. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anki? Naveen, do you want to have a last? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, this, is, this forum has kind of kick-started the requirement for stronger collaboration. I think on part of private sector, uh, we are very keen, and this is something which I'm going to take back to our ICC basis uh, meeting, which is really the caucus, private sector caucus. But I would again make the You're same pitch about, microphone. again make the same pitch about how do we uh, get the decentralization model into yeah. place? Because that is core to scale. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have one request first. I hope that we're going to have this workshop also next year. <laughs> a continuation of this, uh, uh, no, not necessarily, in Brazil maybe. Um, the other point I would like to mention that in my dream capacity building workshop, I hope that we focus on three phases, the pre-research phase, the research phase, and the post-research phase. Because I think what we do with the research is very important, and it would be better to train our potential researchers from the very beginning into what they have to go through. Thank you. Last words? Well, I guess mine is actually just to pick up on that, that exact point, is how we manage the research and how we manage the use of it. And yeah. I think, I think Sonny, you made the point of possibly as researchers we need to become more proactive or, yeah. or more active yeah. um, once that research is launched. And I think that is cri critical as well. I think there's a responsibility there to, to make sure that it's actually used by as many people as possible in the way it was intended and to do justice to the quality and the analysis and the meanings of the research as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, research is fun, uh, but it's more fun if we can apply to real problems. I mean, if you can get uh, concrete results based on the research uh, results. So uh, our job as researchers is to conduct research, uh, but the community has to use it uh, in a meaningful way. So as I said, researchers and uh, those who benefit from the research results uh, if we come together, uh, if we bring something concrete, uh, then it's more fun. Thank you.
So uh, thanks a lot for um, everybody who, who's here. I think uh, we, we live in an era of lots of information, of data, and a uh, huge amount of information. But we do need research because we need to talk to people, and, and that's why we do research with children, with other people. We really need to talk to people to uh, improve evidence-based uh, policy making. I thought you were going to invite us to Brazil for the uh, <laughs> continuation of this conversation. <laughs> And I think perhaps maybe you are. So uh, I think that's really my last word. This has been a fabulous um, conversation, and it's just um, midway. It will continue, I hope, over coffee breaks and dinners and uh, the rest of this conference. Um, I really want to thank everyone very much for uh, participating, and this is to be continued uh, in future years. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.